Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Pathfinder presented by Payload, the leading digital media company in the space industry. I'm your host, Mo Islam, and today we welcome Pierre Damien Valjour, co-founder and CEO of Loft Orbital. Loft provides turnkey solutions, both hardware and software, to rapidly build, launch, and deploy satellites in what they call space infrastructure as a service. We'll unpack all that in just a moment, but first, a word from our sponsors. This week's episode is brought to you by Epsilon 3, software for complex engineering, testing, and operational procedures. Epsilon 3's web-based procedure platform enables technicians, operators, engineers, and management to instantly access information around current status of operations, release history, and historical reference of procedural content. Epsilon 3's platform is better suited for coordinating space development workflows than word processing software, Microsoft Excel spreadsheets, and other applications that are not tailored for the industry. For more information, check out epsilon3.io. Pierre, thank you for being in the hot seat today. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Of course. Uh, where are you calling in from? I notice a, uh, a very uh, functional uh, office space behind you. <laughs> yeah, I'm calling actually from our um, San Francisco office. And you can see we have a disco board in the background. That's actually something that we have in all of our satellite operations center. We can talk about that later. But, uh, <laughs> okay, I'll, but, uh, I'll, interesting I'll, work of our offices. I'll add the uh, disco ball to the uh, to the agenda list. Um, so uh, let's let's get right into it. So tell uh, so t- tell us a little bit about um, uh, Loft Orbital, um, how you got started with the business, and and where it is today. Yeah, for sure. Well, Loft is a space infrastructure company, which means our mission is to let our customer simply deploy their missions or their application on our infrastructure in space. And those applications can be either you know physical or virtual. Physical means hardware. So a customer would essentially pay us to fly a piece of hardware they want to fly in space. So a camera, a laser, a radio, you know, something like this. Uh, and virtual means uh, a customer that wants to fly software in space. So there will be a customer that loads you know, AI software to do edge compute and real-time information. Right. Those are really the two different kind of customers, and that, that's really our mission. So the goal in the future into being a place where, you know, similar to the cloud company nowadays, where everybody's using it, but not everybody has to be familiar with the technology. So we get to a point as an industry where everybody can deploy applications in space without knowing anything about the space segment. So to do this, really, our mission is to be able to fly any payload, physical or virtual on any satellite bus, using any ground segment network being deployed in any cloud. And for this, we develop a set of products that allows us to do this. So, so tell me a little bit about how you specifically, um, what, what prompted you to start a business like Loft Orbital and, and how long have you guys been in operation? Yeah, so we started the company about six years ago uh, with two co-founders, Antoine and Alex. We, the three of us met at Spire, uh, another you know, satellite startup. Um, And we really enjoyed working with each other. And really what happened at the time is that we, I think we came to the realization of two things. One was that while the CubeSat industry was extremely exciting and really inspired a lot of new usage, we felt that most of the value and the willingness to pay for customers was from applications that required like bigger spacecraft, bigger physical payloads or bigger compute capabilities. Uh, And The parallel to that was that we realized also that there was really a zero to one value proposition for someone who wants to deploy an application in space. If they want to do it on a CubeSat, there are a number of solution providers there. But if you want to do it on a satellite that is not a CubeSat, all of a sudden you would have to go talk to like a large, typical defense prime. And the, the cost is much higher, the complexity is much higher, the timeline is much higher. And that's really difficult. Um, And so... When we saw that companies were building mass manufacturing facilities for you know satellites that have just one purpose, usually you know carpeting the world with like internet, um, we thought that if we could you know build a set of products that lets us take that satellite of the manufacturing line and then be able to deploy your applications on it, uh, we would really change the way the industry works. Not in a way that is incremental by making it like ten percent better cheaper but in a way that is completely different in how you think about it and what you can achieve. 
How did the three of you um, coalesce on this idea at Spire? What sort of, um, were you guys working together on a similar team, different teams? What, what, what prompted the three of you specifically to get together on this? Um, you know, I think I, I left Spire in the summer of 2016. Uh, and then I, you know, for my background, I really wanted to like start a company. And I really saw kind of like, I, I really felt like some of the things were broken in the space industry. You feel like every company is always reinventing the wheel, rebuilding a single satellite as a one-off. And so again, like when at the time, you know, you had like all those like mass manufacturing companies coming in. And so I started to, you know, talk to Alex and Antoine about it. And uh, the more we talked about it, the more we liked it. And then coming, you know, January 2017, we, um, you know, they left their job at Spire and uh, we decided to incorporate the company like first thing. And then uh, the rest is the story. Okay, Pierre. So let's let's uh, let's rewind the clock to January 2017. You just you're starting Loft Orbital. What was your expectation of the market of the of of, of where the market has become to today versus where you saw it at the time? Because it, space was not as obvious, I think, to the general market in 2017 as it is today. Right? There's obviously much more investor interest in the industry. Um, there's a number of macro things that have changed geopolitically. There's a lot of there's a lot of new tailwinds. Um, which may not have been present in January 2020, or maybe there has been. Maybe maybe you you foresaw that. So maybe talk a little bit about your expectation then about the industry and where where if it if has exceeded it exceeded your expectation or or you know where does it where does it stand today? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think we we saw the industry moving much faster than what we anticipated, uh, and for us that's a great news because you know it always takes a few years to build your product and your solutions to be ready to go to market, and by the time we're ready. The industry had shifted already quite a bit, um, and and really what we saw is when we started the company, we expected to have a few startup willing to trust us and embrace a new model, which essentially means considering like the space segments the same way you would consider cloud, which means you outsource it uh, completely and you just use it as an infrastructure to power your application. And that was not the model at the time. That is still not the model in like most of the space application. You know, most of the industry is like buying their own satellite, owning their own satellite, operating their own satellite. The same way we used to have like our own servers in the garage to like host your own emails. Sure. Which nobody does anymore. And what we had seen is that the value proposition that we put forward was, you know, high enough for large companies to actually trust us and be willing to work with us on that new model because they saw the value that they could get out of that model early on. So we had, you know, commercial contracts with, um, you know, defense and governments across the world with some of the largest, you know, telecommunication company or the large, you know, incumbents in the industry quite early on. Uh, and, and that has helped us, you know, move fast toward that place. So how many spacecraft have you launched so far? So right now we have two satellites in space. Uh, we have 25 satellites manifested, which means we have sold, um, you know, the full capacity on up to 25 satellites. Um, so right now we're, you know, very much at an inflection point where we have launched and developed our products, put them in satellites. We've demonstrated that our products allow us to actually fly any payload on any satellite bus using any ground segment deployed on any clouds or currently flying, you know, a combination of all that. Uh, but the way we've done it so far is more like manual. Like we've delivered about like one satellite per year. Uh, you know, next year we have to deliver more than 10 satellites, like launch more than 10. And so we need to, and right now that's what we're undergoing is like really scaling our company, meaning scaling the funding, scaling the team, scaling the hardware, scaling the facilities, uh, scaling the software to be more autonomous so that we can actually be uh, at the scale we need to be to deliver 10x what we've been delivering last year. But there is no longer any, you know, fundamental change into our product. It is purely about the execution and the scaling of the organization. So I've been following Loft for quite some time. And the reason is actually because I, I, I don't know, Pierre, Damien, I've if you know this. You guys for quite some time as well. Okay, good. Well, good. I love the mutual respect. So, <laughs> so, so uh, Alex and I actually know each other. I've known each other for a little bit. Um, he went to school with one of my closest friends here in New York. So I've, awesome. I've, uh, I've met um, Alex, you know, through, uh, through, through that setting before. And I remember when he was first telling me about Loft Orbital and what you guys were doing. So um, I've had the privilege of following your, your, your success and your traction um, for, for, for a, f- a couple of years now. 
And um, one of the things I noticed was that Loft Orbital used to be the a space as a service, right? And you very recently, I've, I've noticed that you've shifted the wording ever so slightly to space infrastructure as a service. And I do want to talk a little bit about, you know, why that is, what does that shift mean? And sort of what is that, what is the importance of that distinction? Wow, someone has been paying attention. Uh, very, <laughs> no, no, very true. Um, so we've done that for, for a number of reasons. I think the first, the first reason is space as a service. When we introduced the term, I think back in 2017, like that was kind of like a new thing. Uh, but nowadays, like, you know, every company has like space as a service on their website. Everybody talks about doing space as a service. But what they mean by that is something completely different from what we're doing. And so we wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, people understand what we're doing. So when people talk about space as a service in general, typically it is a company that is manufacturing and selling satellites that then in addition offers to do satellite operation for the customers, right? Sometimes they would also like broker the launch, you know, they would do like the system integrator piece, right? That's really the better term. It's like system integrator, right? The right way to think about it is a end-to-end or one-stop shop, right? And you kind of get all your services from that one company. And historically, those companies are their core business is to manufacture satellites, right? That's what most of people talk about when they talk about space as a service. Um, for Loft, we're a completely different beast. First of all, we're not manufacturing satellites, right? We are procuring satellites at scale, uh, and we're building the product that allows us to fly any mission on this hardware. So we're very much focusing on configuring hardware using software products to be able to operate mission that scale. But the, the fundamental difference, and that's why we're using the term space infrastructure, because what we're providing is much closer from a, at all of all, it is much closer to a AWS or a Microsoft Azure, like a cloud company model, right? Where if you think about it, you own, you own and operate hardware where a third party are developing and deploying either hardware at your facility or software at your facility. Right. What we're doing is very similar in the way that we procure third party hardware, you know, satellite, we procure third party services, ground station services, or so much. Um, and the only thing that we do with our customer is we let them deploy their application on our satellites. And so that's a little bit different from. I'm going to manufacture a satellite that meets your needs, right? Um, so even our you know business model is also our customer paying us a monthly subscription, a monthly fee, right, to have a certain level of um, KPIs like service level agreements that are delivered to them. The same way when you pay your phone subscription, right, you're paying like fifty bucks a month, so you can have um, you know four G connectivity up to so many gigabytes and phone connectivity and text message and all that, right? Where we're doing the same thing for our customers, right? So they're not buying, they're not buying a satellite plus some services that include satellite operations, right? They're buying a service, right? We own and operate the satellite. So that's, right. um, that's a difference. So um, I, I'm going to get back to the business model in a second because you've brought up a few things that has prompted some questions in my mind. But um, before we jump into that, just let's talk really quickly, high level. What are your current product offerings, right? So if I'm a if I, if I am a potential customer, I, I approach um, you guys and, and and looking for your your service. Like what 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 can I do? What level of customization? Um, what do I have access to today? And maybe what does that look like? And call it a few years. Yeah. So right now we can fly. Any physical payloads, right? So customer furnished hardware, typically, you know, could it up to 100 kilogram kind of class? Um, you could be as big as 100 kilogram. You could be as small as like, you know, half a kilogram. Um, we fly you in a ride share fashion in our satellites. Um, so that's for the physical payloads. Or you can come with a piece of software that you want to fly, right? So you've developed your own, you know, AI, you know, software that does detection of typically it's detection of change or detection of certain elements you can identify a ship a plane on a picture you can identify a fire on a thermal image you can identify a tank because you see aluminum from a hyperspectral image you know whatever that is and you come up with that software that you want to run on our satellites to provide information as a real time information derived typically from your own analytics that you provide on the ground to your customers. So that, that's really I mean, our core two offerings right now. 
So you could, you could theoretically, and you, I assume you must have multiple customers on the same bus infrastructure, right? Uh, we can, but we don't have to. It really depends. Okay. Um, so like one of our you know largest customer, Earth Daily, is like um, asking us to fly a constellation of ten different sensors, right, on ten different satellites, or that you know, being a constellation that operates one mission, right, based on the ten satellite nodes. And, um, you know, they are taking the entire satellite. At the same time, we have some very small customers that are, uh, you know, sharing satellites as well. Um, so it really depends on, you know, the needs for your mission. It's, think about it as a paper resource base, right? So depending on your mass, your power, your data volume, your latency, like all the different parameters, um, we will charge you for, you know, it's kind of like pay as you go. So um, just taking the, call it to smaller customers, maybe not the customers that are buying up the, you know, an entire, um, an, you know, an entire bus, but how do you manage sort of the complexity of delivering, you know, multiple payloads for customers on the same mission, especially if they have like, you know, very diverse needs or requirements? Um, you know, maybe one has some type of sensor related to earth observation. One has a totally different sensor for some other some other um some other use case like how do you think about managing those different types of requirements for maybe smaller players yeah typically in the space industry that has been a huge challenge uh this is not something the space industry has done because usually the way aerospace engineering works is you start from the mission requirements the payload requirements and then you design a satellite bus that meets those requirements right so there is always an element of like one of manufacturing one of design right the concept of I'm taking a satellite bus that has already flown before, like as is, no change whatsoever, and I fly it for another payload is pretty much impossible. Like, you know, it doesn't work like that. Um, what we've built is two products. One is called the hub, one is called cockpit, that allows us to fully separate the bus engineering from the payload engineering. They're not actually touching the others, they're not talking with each other. Um, and we've done that by having Cockpit on the ground, which is an autonomous software for satellite operation that lets a customer basically connect to their instrument, receive their data without having to see anything in the middle. So it serves sort of as an automated layer of abstraction that abstracts the ground segment, abstract the you know the antennas, abstract the satellite bus, and connect them directly to their payload. Yeah, and at the same time we have the hub, right, which is the piece of hardware and software that sits in the satellite bus that, again, like allows to separate fully the payload from the bus. So because we have this, we and that, that's, that's really going to go to speak to your question, where we really have, before a customer comes to us, everything about the satellites, the ground segments, the operation, all that fully modeled in software. So when we have customer coming in, even very late in the game, it is quite easy for us to add small payloads on existing missions because we, run, we can rerun full day in the life con ops, like simulation, because we already have all the engineering done. If we had to like, change the engineering to accommodate them, then we would need you know, another year of work as opposed to another like, 48 hours of work. So it's really the power of, being, of having built software, model, software modelization tools and having a solution where we start with engineering being done, right? The satellite is already built and designed. That allows us to focus on configuration, concept of operation, and really focus on the customer mission. That's why we can do it like really fast last minute, as opposed to having to rerun a full design of the program. So now, um, in terms of the bulk buying of the buses, are you able to, I assume the answer to my next question is yes, are you able to generate sufficient cost savings on the buses in bulk? And do you think that there is a potential to vertically integrate that longer term for economic reasons, or do you see no reason that you, to do that? So maybe the yes is for just for the first question. Um, so on the, <laughs> on the first question, I guess the... There are some savings. I, I don't know that they're that big when you buy like in bulk. Uh, really what, what is the value for us is the ability to have a partner, right? A supplier that can produce satellite at scale. So, you know, if I go to a customer and sell a 30 satellite constellation, right? Or, you know, a number of missions based on, a, on a, something that requires 30 satellites, right? 
and I'm a startup. And if I say, yep, yeah, I've built one satellite last year, next year I can build 30 satellites at like, you know, 200 kilogram class. That would be ridiculous, right? You need to build the facility. You need to build, like, it, you know, it takes half a billion dollars of capital and it takes like five years to just build the capability to have that kind of production rate. Uh, but if I go and I say, and specifically, I am not the one building the satellite. I am using a supplier that, you know, over the past 10 years has invested a billion dollars into facilities to mass manufacture the satellite. And they've actually built like 500 of those, right? Now, can they deliver 30? Can they deliver 50? Can they deliver 100? Absolutely, they've already done it. So I can say that because I am not doing that myself. Could we do it for 20% cheaper, 20% better, 20% faster if we were to virtually, vertically integrate? Probably, right? But I would need to invest the next five years of loft into that manufacturing capability. And it's a whole, you know, it's, it's a different uh, skill. It's like running a factory. It is technicians. It is building hardware at that scale. That's not what we do. I'd much rather in, like pay the 20% premium to our suppliers and invest into the mission configuration, the autonomy in our software, into the full development, test, deployment capability of AI software in space, partnering with cloud companies to do this. Right? That, that seems more like what Loft is about. So right now, there is no plan to vertically integrate, even though that is a, um, it is a complexity for Loft, you know, to manage this. But, but there is so much more value that we can build and return to our shareholders by focusing on um, the development of software and mission configuration. How do you build long-term partnerships and ensure... Uh, the minimization of supply chain risks? Like, how do you um, get those partners to be aligned with you in terms of timing and, you know, longer term vision? Yeah. And I mean, and that's true. We've been talking about like the, you know, the bug buy of satellites, but keep in mind, we've also built, we also built boats, uh, if that's a thing. Um, you know, all the elements for our hubs. So we procured like 250 computers. We procured like close to 100 radios. Um, we've procured like, power units, we've procured structure like thermal and stuff like this for like, you know, high tens of units. So we have those relationships with suppliers, not just for the bus. We've also procured like, you know, tens of launches, right? So, so it's across the entire industry. We're also procuring our own dedicated ground station to number of like a ground station or a service provider. Um, so, so we're really building this relationship across the value chain, not just with the bus. But with all of them, I think the, the situation is the same. Uh, loft mindset. Again, if you go back to our mission to be able to fly any payload on any satellite with any ground segment deployed on any cloud, which means for this, on those four dimensions, we always work with multiple suppliers. So, you know, we've procured satellites from like four different suppliers, um, not just one. Uh, and so that allows us to have, to limit the supply chain risk on one way and, you know, keep the competition healthy. Uh, on one side. On the other side, uh, we've also, we're generally a good partner because what we're doing is not what our supplier do. So there is very little overlap, very little competition, and there is a lot of synergies. Um, so a lot of times, you know, we're almost a sales channel for our own suppliers. Uh, so we have really strong partnership because I think Loft as a company from a, you know, ethical business mindset has proven itself to be a good partner. And I think we are really working hard to maintain and develop that reputation in the industry. Uh, but more than that, I think we also just provide value for our suppliers, not just the monetary value, but we also allow them to have, uh, sometimes when we partner together on offerings for customers, we allow them to have a better offering, right? So you can think about even the last contracts we got with the uh, US uh, Department of Defense, Right, which was a contract where we beat together with Bull Aerospace and Microsoft, right? It was the three of us. And, um, you know, Bull is also manufacturing buses and offering satellite services, uh, not for that program. And we actually buy, you know, launches, satellites, hardware, and services from other companies at Bull and other companies at Microsoft. But they still see that together we have a value proposition for the end user that is much higher than individually. And, yes. That's what works well. Yeah. So there's a there's a few different contracts that you've mentioned. So maybe let's let's talk a little bit about the commercial success. So you mentioned the EDA, um, the EDA uh, 
relationship um, that's relatively new, which I, I, I believe from what I saw publicly is about 150 million. They're paying you 150 million to launch and operate um, a fleet of about 10 EO satellites. Um, and then you have the SDA Next program, which you're mentioning right now, which is the partnership with Ball and, 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 and Microsoft, which I think is about 176 million from what I saw. Uh, maybe talk a little bit now. The, the, those are those are um, you know commercial government, right? You know, I'm, I'm, I, I want to get into how, where you see the near term opportunity for the business, whether it's in commercial or government. But before we jump into that, just curious, uh, you know, uh, those two initial contracts. Um, what do you think it means for the business? Um, and uh, you know, maybe talk also a little bit about Microsoft, right, and the partnership that you have with Azure and why they decided to work with you. Okay, so quite quite a few things to unpack. Yeah, there. no, sorry, so, <laughs> threw a lot at you there. <laughs> That's Maybe let, let's let's start with Microsoft because I know you just mentioned SDNX. Let's talk a little okay. bit about Microsoft relationship. <laughs> um, so the Microsoft, like we we have built a very strong partnership with Microsoft, uh, where Microsoft is both a customer and a partner. Of course, what we value the most is a relationship as a partner, and we are together developing an end to end solution that we let any software developer in the world. Developing code on Azure, right? Develop, test, and deploy, and have a CI CD pipeline environment, right? With the ability to deploy your code on a satellite. So, all the simulation that you need to do, all the hardware in the loop that testing that you need to do, or the verification on the satellite, or the deployment of the code on the satellite, and all the things that you need to be able to run the, the software on the satellite is, you know, something that is offered as a co-development between Loft and, and Microsoft. Before that, that's really important. That's really interesting. We've seen with the advance of AI in, spe- AI in general, we've seen a lot of interest into more and more pushing AI capabilities on the satellite, on the edge, if you will, uh, for real-time applications, for autonomous decision-making applications. and uh, for us, the ability to work with a you know a company the size of Microsoft um, really allows us to well, first of all it forces us to level up the maturity of our product, um, but also it allows us to have a much bigger impact. So when you talk about vision, you know if you're presenting a future where Loft is the infrastructure provider in space and everybody wants to do something in space is using Loft the same way. Whenever you want to do something on the internet, you have to use a cloud company, right? Um, if you want to present that vision credibly, you need to have the partner that supports that kind of scale. I think being able to partner with the launch provider, the satellite manufacturer that can have that scale, right, like SpaceX, the Airbus, and others, um, is important. But at the same time, being able to partner with companies like Microsoft uh, on the ability to access, you know, communities of like you know thousands, hundreds of thousands of developers. Um, is really part of what allows us to credibly trying to be a leading space infrastructure company in the future. Got it. So, so zooming out for a second, um, where do you see near term the largest opportunity for Loft? Is it in the commercial side, or is it on the is it on the government side? Um, how are you kind of thinking about resource allocation between those two um, customer segments? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, that you know that might be a bit sad, but but the reality is like right now a lot of the growth is driven by you know two of the largest challenges that humanity is facing right now, which is uh, global safety, national security, and climate change. Right, and a lot of those are driven by or are, you know addressed by governments. So with the war in Ukraine, we have seen a lot of interest in defense capabilities, monitoring capabilities, information, intelligence gathering capabilities from a number of governments. Uh, in that sense, Loft has been established both in the US and in Europe with you know, different kinds of companies. And so we're able to address you know, classified work for the US government, but also you know, defense work with you know, the French government, for example. One from a subsidiary that is based in France and one from a subsidiary in the US, Loft Federal, that can work in the classified environment. So we've been really putting a lot of effort into actually being one of the few companies that is able to do this across the pond. Uh, if you look at the largest market, I mean, US is the biggest market. Right after you would have probably like China, 
Russia, you know, China is not an option whatsoever. Russia is maybe even less as an option nowadays anyway. And then the next largest market would be Europe, right? So the two largest market accessible by, quote unquote, a Western company, right, would be Europe and US, and we can address those from a governmental standpoint. Uh, we still see, I think, an enormous increase of interest from companies that provide um, data analytics information to their customers. And I think that's where, in my opinion, you will see a much larger number of customers, maybe of smaller size on the commercial side, uh, that will use, you know, maybe try to be using some of the more advanced or, you know, edge capabilities. So using compute capability on the satellite, trying to get information more real time, providing a larger uh, volume of information to their customer. Um, and you definitely see that, right? So I think there is a small number of very large customers and that's governments in general. And then, and then you see a large number of smaller customer and that's commercial. Got it. I, I want to talk a little bit more about Lost Federal. Uh, but before we do that, um, we do have to take a very quick break, Pierre, Damien. And when we come back, uh, we, can, we can dig into that a little bit more. So stay with us for just a second. By utilizing Epsilon 3 software platforms, engineers can create builds, track builds through AIT, revise and trust test procedures, and more. Not only will engineers save time and frustration looking for information in multiple places, but it will speed up your AIT processes. Unlike using simple documents or generic project management tools, Epsilon 3 provides synchronization and standardization that streamlines and refines processes and procedures. Check out their website, epsilon3.io, for more information. Pierre Damien, welcome back. So one of the challenges that I've heard from other or what I would say companies that are doing any type of government work, really, any, especially on the satellite bus side, is that there's always this balance between how do you cater to the government's needs, which oftentimes requires customization and sometimes a very deep level of customer customization versus, you know, when you, you know, when you think about sort of scaling a platform, you want it, you want things to be as templatized as possible. So how do you think about balancing that? Or have you seen that? Is, is, is that an issue for you? Like, you know, governments tend to like things hyper customized for whatever payload or mission that they're looking to looking to achieve. Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably true. And it depends also who you're working with, right? In which government and which entity. Um, you know, we've done a real work with, with the Space Force on cybersecurity, machine learning stuff. Uh, we've done some work with other agencies like DARPA. Um, our largest contract today is with a space development agency, right? The SDA, which has been honestly doing a phenomenal job at like trying to come in and try to do something that, you know, defense agency have been trying to do for like 10, 15 years, but haven't really been able to do. And they're really pushing the envelope into how they're working with their, with their suppliers, how they're working with industry, both trying to enable a sustainable, large, resilient uh, industry base in the US, but also evolving the practice of how you procure and how you deploy satellite and satellite services. So I, I think they've been doing a phenomenal job and I think we're lucky to work with them because they're probably one of the more, I would say more of the easier customer you know, to work with in that sense. Um, so that's what I would want to acknowledge first. Uh, then I think you're right. There, you know, there are always a number of like deep customization that you need to do for every customer like this. Um, the thing where I think Loft is different is that we don't really have the one-off mentality. So everything we have to do for a customer like this, we would want to incorporate in a product that can then be reused for other customer in a similar way, right? So if SDA comes back with another contract or the Space Force comes with another contract, right? We will be able to reuse what we've developed for that program because again, it's not developed as a one-off for that program in a way that can be only used for that program. And actually, when we develop those, we don't develop those with the um, customer money, right? We specifically exclude any product development from the, the contract with the customer. So that allows us to reuse it with another US agency after that, right? Um, and that is maybe a slightly different way we actually use like venture capital money to do this, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to a larger prime who is using, you know, only relies on that customer money for that. Uh, but that allows us to maybe implement it in a way that is done and thought with scale in mind, right? So the feature is the same, but the implementation is much more scalable, essentially. 
So uh, let's 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 talk for a second about um, your competition, um, and you don't have to certainly name any names, but I, I I will bring up a couple examples, and I'm curious how you think about it. So, um, you know, w- what would you say is really the key differentiator for for Loft when it comes to a um, an organization, a government, a business that's looking to potentially put up you know, a constellation of 20, 50 satellites up into space. Um, you know, there's a few different options that those companies have. There's legacy providers that that provide bus infrastructure. There's companies like York Space, which sort of, you know, fits more into the new space category. Um, wh- what would you say are the key different, what is the key differentiator or differentiators of, of loft orbital versus using a provider like that? Yeah, I think there are quite a few. At a very high level, when you're thinking like almost philosophically about it, Loft allows you to have the agility, simplicity, um, execution speeds of a new space company with the reliability manufacturing processes uh, that you would really want from a legacy traditional aerospace company. Right? So... When I'm telling you, like, you know, my bus are built by like Raytheon, right? you're not going to question the reliability of the satellites. If I tell you, I'm building the satellite in my garage, like, you might feel a bit differently about it. Right? But Loft is really building the service and the mission configuration for the customer. So that, that ability to benefit from modern software practices and you know, fast pace of execution while retaining the reliability in the hardware for like space, reliable space application that you want is, I think, something quite unique. Right? That means we don't vertically, integ- we don't vertically integrate. Right? But, but that, I think, is something that resonates very much with the customers in general. Because usually you can have one or the other, and they both have like, benefits and you know, pros and cons. But Loft kind of like, allows you to have both. Um, the other, I think, element of value proposition is really the product mindset. Right? So it's with our two products, Hub and Cockpit, we can use the same satellite bus, but for very different applications. So if you think about the contract we have with SDA, uh, it is for flying a number of payloads in different configurations. So not every satellite is identical. Every satellite is actually different, but the satellite bus is always the same. And that is possible because of of products. So that allows you to go much faster. But if you had to redesign the bus and do like seven different buses, then you would probably need like more time and more money. So it's really about the ability to use a standard hardware that is configured for any kind of mission. Remember, fly any payloads. Uh, could be very different. Very different con ops, very different physical payload, very different software, very different interfaces, very different mission overall, but using the same hardware that is built at scale. And so you get the reliability of you know that manufacturing processes. Uh, so I, I, I have a question um, about the market and where the market is going. And 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 you know I, I saw an interview with um, I got one fact wrong. I hope I don't not, I hope I don't get a, another fact wrong here. So let me let me I'm let me give it me somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, that's very possible. Let let me let me give it another shot. So um, the CEO of Leo Stella um, recently I saw some I saw a Space News article. Um, Leo Stella, for, for the audience, is a manufacturer of, of, of small satellites, recently quoted to say that the company is actually under capacity um, and, and the company currently lacks demand visibility, right? Do you think that's a near-term phenomenon or do you disagree with what sort of the, the, um, the, that sort of market dynamic? Yeah, you mean they have more production capabilities than customers? Correct. Yeah. Well, for us, it's a great news. As you may know, we also buy satellites from Leo Stella. We have yep. actually one that came in like last week in our office. We have another one coming later this year. Our two next satellites that we launched are using a satellite bus from Leo Stella. So they're also a really good partner. We, we like them a lot. We've been working with them for years. They are really good. So we are uh, very happy to work with them. So when they have uh, extra capacity in their production, uh, for us, it's you know a good news, I guess. Um, that means we can buy more. Yeah, uh, so we're we're happy to hear that. Maybe, um, maybe give you a little pricing power. <laughs> uh, not, not, not as much as you would think. Uh, not as much as you would think. 
but you know price is just one factor like really the in this industry i mean the, if you deliver reliably that's really what matters to customer right. deliver something reliably and on time you know i would take a supplier that gives me a piece of hardware on time on spec you know anytime over someone who is feeding me something cheaper because that can go horribly wrong like having the trust and confidence to get something on time is enormous and you know leo stella has delivered to us on spec and on time on numerous occasions and that's Unfortunately, in this industry, that's not the norm. That's pretty exceptional. Right. Um, so we, we like them a lot for that reason. Uh, for the market standpoint, yeah, I think that's. I think their situation may be very specific. Uh, you know, some companies had plans to work closely with. Um, I would say, like maybe one specific company that were going to order a lot of satellites. Um, and you know, there was like the whole spike craziness in 2021. A lot of startups were like raised a lot of capital. Um, their sustainability beyond you know their runway. Um, for all startups, you know, including ourselves, is always in question. Uh, where I think Loft is a little bit different is that you know most of the most of the satellite startups are kind of like launching their own field of satellite to collect data X, right? Like planets collecting optical data, Spire collect like RF data, Capella ISI collect like radar data, and so forth, right? It's kind of like uh, a model that is pretty common. Loft is not exactly that. Like Loft is a multi-mission, multi-purpose infrastructure. So you kind of edge across the entire industry, right? When you um, when you work with Loft. So for us, like we we still have a lot of demands. Like if there were to, if there were to be less demand in like one type of data and more in the other one, um, it doesn't really matter too much for us. Uh, that might matter more for those companies that are building application on one specific application. Where you bet kind of like all your eggs on like one application. So you mentioned uh, you mentioned a, a couple of things around SPAC and the kind of alluding to the fundraising market, which we'll get back to in just a second because I think it's an interesting point. Um, but before we get into that, I do want to talk uh, just a, a little bit on on more of a sort of vision statement over the next kind of five to ten years in sort of in terms of technological innovation. Where do you think the next big leap is going to be for the satellite industry, and how is Loft kind of preparing for um, pre- preparing for that? Yeah, <clears throat> that's where I'm getting to like more like, you know, opinion and not facts. So yes. it's like, you know, four looking statements. So my opinion uh, is that the industry will move away from an industry where everything is designed as a custom one-off and everyone owns and operates their own satellite to more of an infrastructure uh, solution. Again, very much like the cloud and the servers environment. You know, we used to all have servers to do anything. And now nobody even know what a server is. Like, look at us now, like we're having that conversation, right? Where we could be on two different continents. None of us really know what is the massive amount of technology that went into allowing me to speak with you and you to see it with like less of a millisecond of delay. And there are like, you know, sub ocean cables. There are like data farms in like Kentucky and like an amount of software that is massive. None of us know how that works. None of us care. We're just using it. Right. I think space is going to go in the same direction. Right now, to my knowledge, space is one of the last industry where to be able to use it, like if you want to buy a satellite, you need to know how to build a satellite. Like if you had to know how to build a microwave to use a microwave, none of us would use microwaves, right? We don't know how that works. We press a button and it's get hot and we're happy with it. Um, space doesn't work like that. Like, you know, you still get asked like the specifics of your triple E parts on a PCB board when someone buys a hundred million dollar satellite. It's like, why do you have to do that? Because it's always a custom one-off. It's a redesign. If you were to design a new microwave, who would ask you about this? You're not designing a new microwave. You're just mass manufacturing them. So I think that's where the industry is going to shift. Mass manufacturing capabilities, company that provides services, and people that are using the services without having to know how to design a power conditioning unit for a, you know, satellite. That, that's really where I think it's going. And if you think about companies like, you know, take AWS, right? They probably buy a lot of servers, um, mass manufactured by some company probably in like another country. Uh, but then what they do is they operate their hardware, operate data farms and or data centers. And what they focus on is building the software that lets users use that third-party hardware, right? Without having to worry about the hardware. And we want to do the same thing with the entire space industry. 
Now, is that a five-year or 10-year vision or sooner in your mind? Um, I think it's going to be, I don't think it's going to be zero to one. I think it's gradual. Mm -hmm. Like you already see more and more customer adopting this, more and more customer wanting to get there. It takes a culture shift in organization. It takes a technology shift. It takes, you know, it takes quite a lot to get there fully. So I think if you tell me like in 10 years, like that would have been transition, that seems reasonable. And like most of the adoption will happen over the next five years. Uh, keep in mind, like, you know, you, for, for the transition to have been fully happening, all the assets in space would need to have been deprecated, right? right. And so that's probably a 15 years time horizon to have a fully, like a fully done transition. So uh, let's talk fundraising. So okay. um, in late 2021, uh, you guys raised $140 million um, in, in, in a round that was led by BlackRock. BlackRock is not really known as a space investor. So why did BlackRock invest or how did you, uh, how did you get them to invest? What was the, what was the part of the story that I think, you know, it was, it was, I think it surprised a lot of folks in the industry to see that name on, on a cap table at that, at that scale. Yeah, I think you're right. And, and BlackRock didn't invest in us because we're a space company, right? I think the, the one thing that is, that has been consistently different about Loft is basically being a company that is able to consistently generate revenue and revenue growth. So if you look over the past, like, you know, five years, like every year we either tripled or deployed our revenue, right? So we're now getting to a place where the numbers are, you know, higher than they were before. Um, but, but that is really the difference with, um, again, if you take the traditional model where you deploy your own satellite fleets, where you have your sensor and then, you know, you hope you will be able to get customers to buy the data you generates. It forces you to have a little bit of a leap of faith and then to spend the capital to build your infrastructure for several years. And then eventually you can generate revenue, right? Loft model like, is a bit different. So we're able to generate revenue from you know, almost a year in, in existence. Uh, so that, I think, attracted a different kind of investor. The business model of being an infrastructure, so we own the infrastructure and we let customer deploy application on infrastructure is something that like, you know, asset managers are much used to, uh, much more used to. So I think they were looking at us way more from that perspective than from a space company. The fact that our infrastructure happened to be in space was like, you know, almost a side piece of the story. Um, but it was really looking at the size of the market, the growth of the market. And again, the shift in the market as evidenced by the number of customers that are willing to take that path. Right. How, how are you navigating the current market on, on, the, on the fundraising side or on the, on the, on the investor side? You, know, you came from Spire. This is a company we taught you. You mentioned SPACs earlier. This is a company that was one of the early satellite operators that have decided to go, decided to go public by a SPAC. Um, and you know, the SPAC route has not been super friendly to many of the companies in general, but especially the space companies that have taken that route. You know, where do you where do you see investor sentiment when it comes to satellite any type of satellite platform today and where do you see it going um i think that there are like very two different type of question one being what is the current market environments and the view towards back and the second one is what is the view toward like the space economy in general um you know we back in 2021 we decided to not do a spac but to do a private round which meant you know raising a little bit less of capital because the spac would have probably let us raise like twice as much capital, probably at like 2x or 3x of valuation. Um, but we were just not ready to be a public company at all, like in any way, shape or form, right? So we could have like fast track that just for the sake of like the short-term gain on raising capital. But I don't think that would have set the company for long-term success. Uh, so we decided to stay private at the time. I, I think retrospectively, that was the right decision, but... Um, you know, when being a public company is very difficult, uh, we were not ready for it. Well, hats off, hats off to you for making that decision because it's, it was a, it was a tough, it's, it's, you know, I, I, I've spoken to many companies who, who had the opportunity to go public via SPAC and, you know, it was a massive monetization event for a lot of founders, for a lot of shareholders. And, you know, it was very, it's very tough to say no to that. Um, but it is, I mean, it is a, yeah, it is that decision. We have a board that really sees, I think what helped us is we have a board that sees, that really believes in this company. They invested a lot of like rounds. 
and they really want us to be a, you know, they don't want us to be a company that is valued at SPAC and then stays at the valuation or do like 20% a year and certainly not like minus 70%. Um, like they want us to be like at a different class of companies. And so they really helped us like think through and visualize the journey from where we were at the time to how do we get there, right? And it's not just like run, run, it's just not short-term success. It is how do you get to the, to the end goal? And right. if you really want to deploy your vision, you know, once you're going to be a publicly traded company, it would be much harder to keep executing on the longer term vision. You're going to be on a quarterly cadence um, that, you know, is very appropriate for mature company and is very not appropriate for not mature enough company. So you have to think about that very carefully. Um, we also have a lot on our plate, like, you know, having that conversation is a, is a nice part of the job. The reality is like there is an enormous amount of work to be able to scale from like one at a time to like 10 at a time when it comes to satellite. And the amount of time or disruption that turning our company into a public company would have been like just probably too much for us to continue thriving. So that's why we made the decision. So I think um, that's one side. Now to the other point of your question, which is around how do the investors see the space economy right now? I think it is um, you know, extremely hot. Uh, this is still in very high demands because you know, this is an industry that is a little bit counter cyclical. So yes, uh, you know, maybe the retail industry is down, but it doesn't like, you know, the DOD budget across the world has never been higher. The funding towards like climate change and weather has never been higher. The, you know, the funding and the amount going into like AI development has never been higher. So from like all the different sides, that economy is growing more so than ever before. So there is a huge demand, but the demand is a little bit different. Before it was a demand for anything, like you were doing something space, like, great, I want to do something space. Now it is like, well, I want space in my portfolio, but I want space from companies that are actually having real customer, delivering real value and have a real growth potential, right? And so that's, that's a little bit different. Like the bar is definitely higher, um, but the interest is as high as I have ever seen. So how many, uh, how many employees are you at? Uh, we're like something like 175 now. 175. And then you, ha you have um, uh, facilities in obviously San Francisco where you're sitting. Denver is the other one? Yes. Yeah, so we have actually three facilities in Colorado. Then, oh, three uh, facilities in Colorado. Okay. I see. Wow. Because uh, we, have, we have the Loft Federal Office. Hmm. Uh, and then the Loft Orbital Office is spread two ways. We have the Loft Orbital Offices and we have the manufacturing floor for you know, receiving the, you know, 40 satellites that we've ordered and like the uh, building all the hubs for those. Yes. And, and, and you have Toulouse as well. And we have Toulouse France. as well. Exactly. Yes, we have France as well. So uh, I, I did want to talk very, uh, I, I know we're running out of time here, but I did want to talk a little bit about that office. What, what, what's happening in Toulouse, France? And what's the history there? Why is there an off? Why is there a, a loft office in, in Toulouse? And uh, I, uh, I, I actually remember talking to Katie on your team about it being the aerospace capital of France. And she corrected me and said, it's actually the aerospace capital of Europe. So <laughs> tell <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I think we, um, as I said, we wanted to be able to address like the two largest markets in the world for like a Western company, which is us and, uh, and Europe, right. Uh, you know, the three co-founders were, I mean, we've been living in California for the past 10 years or so of our life. Like, so, um, you know, we started the company there, obviously. Uh, after a couple of years, we're like, okay, how do we extend to Europe? Um, and there were a number of places there, a number of companies are giving away a lot of grants and money, a number of countries are giving away a lot of grants to attract you. Every, every country is kind of like having their own like value proposition. Uh, ultimately, we went with France for a number of reasons uh, that were not obvious at the time, but uh, I mean, it is the largest uh, space economy in Europe. Um, this is one of the friendliest country to get visa. So one of the challenge, of course, in the U.S. is to hire international people uh, because you know it's difficult to bring in to bring them in the country. Much easier to do that in Europe. So if I have, you know, um, a really high caliber talent from Australia, it is easier to bring them in, like in, in France and other places. Um, and then we had, I think we had a lot of political support as well, uh, and we've demonstrated that we're growing there. So there is read that side of the story as well, where um, we can have a very high caliber team 
we can scale the team there. Uh, and actually, this is the team that has, this is actually my size of office. This is the largest office nowadays. Um, they're all about the same, but, but Toulouse is a bit bigger. Uh, but given that you have three offices in Colorado that kind of like dilute it as well, uh, fair enough. Um, so, so there were a lot of government support, uh, and we're very happy to be there, uh, in France. And then Toulouse, as Kitty mentioned, that's like, yeah, that's your pro capital of Europe. So, um, that, that was kind of the obvious location when you're thinking about a base in Europe. Two, two more questions here as we wrap up. So first is, uh, what's a company that you are most excited about in the industry? SpaceX. What they've done <laughs> is, it's not original, yes. but what they've done is so ridiculous. They're launching right. every week. They're thinking about like Starship, like, you know, the transporter program that they've developed for right share missions going to SSO orbits are, it's insane, like how easy it has made you know, the life of the entire industry. Right. And right now they kind of have a monopoly on this, but they're so good, right? So right. Um, I would be excited for anyone who can reach that level of execution. I certainly would hope that we have a bit more of that in Europe as well. Um, and there are a number of initiatives, but it takes a long time to build rockets. To me, that's the company I'm most impressed with. So I've asked this question seven or eight times, and believe it or not, I think I've only heard it one other time. So okay. it actually is a little bit more of an original answer than, than, than one might think. So uh, fair enough. And I, I think at this point, they're also launching like two, twice a week at their current cadence, which is, which well, yeah. is phenomenal. Uh, so, uh, so, so give me, um, so last question here, uh, give me a, a recommendation or maybe your favorite book or movie about the space industry. Oh, wow. Uh, that's a good one. Um, it's funny. I mean, those, I it's, 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 it's what you, you think those are the easiest questions and they trip people up the most. <laughs> well, because, I mean, because you have a lot of like things you're like, I mean, I, right. you know, I'm a fan of Star Wars from like the early days. Um, so, okay. Um, I think Interstellar is a good movie to watch. Um, I, it depends like who you're talking to, right? I think the Apollo 13 movie, right? Is absolutely awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I haven't watched it in a very long time. Maybe it edged a little bit. So like someone more like younger person watching it now would be like, it feels like it's in black and white. Uh, <laughs> so, so maybe, maybe not ideal, but that, that would maybe be my recommendation. Like if you haven't watched it, like go watch Apollo 13. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, that's a great, that's actually a really good one. I, I don't think that's one of, that's, that's the type of movie that does age. It's a phenomenal movie. Pierre Damien, really appreciate you uh, being on the show. Thank you so much. Um, I know you're a busy guy, but thank you for carving out the time to speak with us today. Thanks for having me. I, uh, you know, I watch the show quite often, so I'm glad to be here um, and uh, hope that would be interesting for people. Yes, amazing. Well, excited to have you back in the future.